Hey everybody, it is December 2nd, 2018, and it's your episode 169 of At Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me today are Laurel Black. Hi. And Megan Arns is here. Hello. So y'all, our guest today is the Chair of Percussion Studies at the University of Washington. She is widely known for performances and commissions of new experimental musics and projects that include new notation, interdisciplinary performance, and especially what I've seen her do a whole lot at PASIC and all over the place, music for speaking percussionist. She is uh, an incredibly active and widely known performer of especially new music, and her name is Bonnie Whiting. How's it going, Bonnie? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. So good to see you and see you briefly there at PASIC. How was your PASIC? Are you recovered? I think basically recovered. You know, Megan and I were just chatting, saying that it feels like the older I get, the less time I actually have to hang and listen to other people's stuff, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Very busy, but so many wonderful people and things. Yeah, for, for sure. Megan and Laurel, what about y'all? You recovered? I know Laurel's not, because we're not, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Just, you know, the last couple of weeks of the semester, I don't know if it's the same for you all, but with lots of holiday concerts and everyone needs percussion right now, <laughs> apparently. Yep. 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 So that's where lots we're of that at. Coming on. Yeah, I'm curious. I um, Something I missed at PASIC that I really wanted to spend more time with, which I think that you're involved in, Bonnie, is the Diversity Alliance. Yeah the diversity initiative. Can you talk about that a little bit and what happened at PASIC? I mean, there's so many cool projects. I'm seeing the, um, the interviews, there was a booth, there was a, seemed like a well-attended meeting. Um, I'm just curious if you could speak about that a little bit. Yeah, more. absolutely. And I want to say first that the cool thing about the group, the Diversity Alliance, is that it is more of an open alliance than a structured committee. Um, unlike a lot of the PAS service organizations, you don't actually have to apply to be a member and get voted in. Uh, so there is a large contingent of folks who are super interested. And um, basically, it's it's a group of people who get together once at PASIC wanting to talk about ways that we can make our percussive community more inclusive and welcoming to other people. Um, and, you know, talk about ways we're already doing that and ways that members feel like we could do more. Um, so one thing that's kind of amazing is that certainly different people have different areas of focus. So for example, someone might be interested in say women in the percussion community. There is a small subcommittee based on special concerns for people in the historically black colleges and universities community and how their representation can be improved in PAS and the percussion community in general. Um, you know, things for say, people who are musicians, like being more inclusive of the disabled or differently abled community, like making PASIC and the Percussive Arts Society more accessible. So those are just a couple of examples. Um, so it's a really great opportunity to meet people who really want to work on that from a, a place of common ground. Um, mm -hmm. And in addition to that this year, uh, Julie Hill, former president, kind of spearheaded this project to record people just talking a little bit about their experiences um, in our community with diversity or just, you know, talk about themselves, super open-ended kind of a question. And I know she and some others have been posting some of those videos throughout convention. So it's been yeah. super productive. I worked at the, the, the Diversity Alliance had a little booth in the exhibit hall, conveniently located right across from Steve Weiss Music. So we yeah. got traffic. Lots um, of traffic. Yeah. It's actually to have people just sit down and chat and you know, it feels like a great step in the right direction, I think. That's good. What are like some of the action items or things moving forward that were talked about, about at PASIC? Well, some things, for example, were even, even ideas like trying to increase socioeconomic diversity at, you know, at PASIC, for example. So finding ways to have more scholarships or more infrastructure through education to get people involved, you know, so that it's not at such a high financial cost for them. So that's one example. Or um, partnering with organizations like Hit Like a Girl to, you know, get more um, representation of women on, on the docket. Uh, and a big thing, you know, kind of structurally and organizationally is partnering with individual uh, committee members on 
different committees at PAS and, and you know, for having a representative from each on the diversity um, alliance team so that, you know, all of us, and I say we, I'm on the new music research committee and I'm our liaison, so that we can find ways to make our committees more diverse. Um, a so huge important. thing this, this year, which yeah. I'm, okay, pause for a second. I'm not sure how and if this has become public. It might become public that, you know, a, a whole bunch of statistics were released just about the lack of diversity within PAS, especially in terms of leadership. And I know Julie was talking about eventually how that would come out. I know she brought it to a few organizations for their meetings. Um, but a huge goal that I know that I have that a, that a bunch of us have is just getting more women, people of color, even people from like different parts of the country, you know, not necessarily yeah. just Midwest and South uh, representing in leadership roles at PAS. I think it's so important because that that affects, you know, ev everything within the organization, um, the communities that we're reaching, not, you know, through other initiatives that aren't just PASIC. Um, and like the concerts that are presented, everything like those yeah. committees, essentially, you know, that filters into everything that PAS does. So it's so important to to have, you know, as wide of a community represented. And, you know, we sh sorry, but like we have it easy. Percussion is like represented in every single culture in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and now, you know, it's 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 OK for women to play <laughs> in yeah. most cultures in the world. And so, like, we have no excuses. So I'm so glad that, you know, that that the Diversity Alliance exists now and that it sounds like there's hopefully a lot of change to come in the near future. So that's yeah. great. Thanks it's for all your work on that. Someone listening so. right now and on the fence about whether or not they want to become involved, it's it's a great opportunity, and we're looking for so many new awesome voices and individuals. Yeah, awesome. wow. What what is what is something just the average listener might be able to do to help this if they're if they're maybe not willing to go as far as getting totally involved, but just in their regular performances or programming, or what would you what would you recommend? Well, a couple, I think a couple of things, like one thing I know that I am doing all the time, even and especially as a female percussionist is how do I check my own bias? You know, am I, am I treating my own female students fairly? Am I listening fairly? Am I trying to kind of take gendered listening out of the equation for me? You know, that's, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, how can you look at the, the, programs you're putting on. Maybe it's even something as simple as, oh, I'm doing my junior recital next year. You know, can I make sure that, you know, maybe there's at least one female composer on that list? And maybe, you know, there's a, there's a composer of, of color on, on that list, you know, kind of expanding your, your horizons, because there's so much great music out there and resources. Like, I don't know if you know about the composer diversity database. I think that's what it called. That's what it's called. Rob Deemer's thing. I mean, there are all kinds of incredible resources for finding works. Um, yeah. And now is the, the perfect time to do it because we have access to so much information. It's very different from when I was an undergrad and you're just like sifting through an outdated computer system or a card right. catalog. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just had a student who did um, an, an entire program, her master's recital, all uh, by women composers awesome. and I love the attitude that she took about it she wasn't originally intending to do that and it was an interest of hers um, she wow. it was an interest of hers but that wasn't the intent for the program and it just turned out that way and I love the message that she sent it wasn't like it was so hard to put this together and I did it it was like Instead, in her program notes, she put together a resource of all of all the women composers for percussion that she could find. I mean, it filled the entire page, like three columns. And she said, I did the work for you. You have no excuse. <laughs> I, would love, I would love to see that, by the way. Yeah, I can send it to you. Yeah. I actually asked her to join this episode, um, but she's got a dress rehearsal for a concert tonight. Uh, yep, yep. But we'll send that your way for sure. But I would say as well, in terms of like, PAS or other other opportunities, if you know of somebody who you think, oh man, they would be a great person, you know, nominate someone or talk to them, find ways, especially, you know, if you're 
in a in a position of privilege. Like I know that I, as holding a full-time university position, I know that affords me a certain amount of privilege. How can I create space for someone else and create an opportunity for someone else, right? You know, use whatever you have for that good. That's so true. And I think we like hold a great deal of responsibility mm-hmm. <laughs> being aware and being in a, privi- a, pr- uh, a position of privilege to, 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 yeah, create that space and to to do things with with PAS rather than, you know, some people just complain about it. And it's like, right. but it's our responsibility. <laughs> it really is. It's our is. only academic society. So if we want it to change, we yeah. have to do that. We have to change it. Exactly. Yeah, I did just want to add um, the Health and Wellness Committee, I think, might be one of the few, if not the only, committee at PAS that has probably always been almost balanced between mm-hmm. men and women. I would guess. And um, at least this year at the meeting at PASIC, our chair, Brad Meyer, he made a a joke like as we all sat down and we got ready to start. And he was like, whoa, there's more women in here than men. We were like, damn straight there are. That's awesome. Um, You know, and it's just kind of (laughs) funny that we made a joke that it's like girly to want to be healthy, I guess. Um, (laughs) It's not, but... (laughs) But we had a good time. But it's nice to see, you know, and, and there's like a big age range of people in there, like not not just women versus men, but young teachers, like people still in their DMAs all the way up to those that have been teaching for a really long time. Yeah. So I just wanted to add that about the Health and Wellness Committee, because I think that's a good thing that's going on right now. I guess um, if I could play devil's advocate for a second, which sucks that I'm doing that because I'm the only male in the conversation, but I'm going to do my best and be brave. So, and this is for everyone. What do, you, what do you say to an argument I've heard both men and women bring up before, which is if you like, if you try to go after a certain composer because of their race or gender and to to try to program them specifically or more often you're actually doing them a disservice because you're picking them for a reason other than just the just the music itself or just the publication like you see that in the sciences this one podcast i listen to about science related things that talk about that in uh, in the publishing world but um, again, it's not my position, but it's an argument I've heard people make. What's what's what do we say to that? Well, there's so much great music out there that I, sure. I can honestly feel like I've never been in that position where I've been really struggling to find somebody or something and like, cho- I, you know, let me start over. <laughs> I think there is. There is a sense that people will sometimes choose a composer to be their token female or their token composer right. of color. And, you know, that doesn't feel good for anybody. Um, but one of the most wonderful things is that we have all of these resources that will help us to find just the right pieces um, that will complement whatever it is that our program needs or that that we really want to do creatively and I can say for myself that I've never been in this position where I felt like oh I really don't want to play this piece but I really have to put something on there by you know to make my program look more diverse and it just feels like you know I've never felt like I've had to compromise in that way and but to that two people not not you I don't think who would make that argument that you know do we have to do this to check boxes? I would say that I would love to challenge everyone to actually think more broadly in terms of criteria of music that they want to program. Um, Because the truth is you're missing out a whole lot if you aren't inclusive. There's a lot to be learned from playing music that you know, maybe is, is different from what you're used to playing. And I would even say there are certain, you know, pieces I've programmed that intentionally, you know, address issues like this, you know, and and that's been a really good thing. If we think about not just one side of the issue that we want, we want just music that is straight ahead. And is you know, the, the pieces that our teachers programmed, therefore our percussion ensembles or therefore our you know, percussion groups will program them and instead think more inclusively of, you know, what is the future of music? I think this is the future of music. I was very long-winded. You'll edit it down. 
I'll try. I'll do my best. <laughs> well, I think that's great. And I, I think it's also, you know, when, when we're faced with an applicant pool that is the vast, you know, if there is a overwhelming majority, I think we're also, you know, responsible for diversifying the applicant pool by reaching out to mm -hmm. more organizations, more communities to have, a, you know, have a more diverse applicant pool rather than just putting it in the same places and then you're going to get the same applicants and people, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think we can do a better job of that. And I think, you know, even in the PAS conversation that we were talking about, like you said, it's it's an academic organization, and if the face of, of that is mostly one one a majority of one gender and a majority of one race, then yeah, we have to work to make mm -hmm. the pool. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I'm specifically talking about like composition competitions, you know, right. um, and I, I think. I just think there's a lot you can do to to come up with a, a more diverse pool so that you're not faced with it. oh well we only had two women apply so do we have to pick one of them right you know, why didn't more women apply because they're there <laughs> right. right i think and what you're trying to say right megan is that these things are systemic and yes. that part of what we have to do is address the system before we have an application pool that makes sense and to be yes. clear they're all different there's so many different reasons why you know, we might not have the application pool that we want. You know, maybe it has less to do with um, issue, an issue of gender or an issue of, you know, ethnicity, but more an issue of socioeconomic standing, for example. And if you're unlucky enough to be in a position where you have two or three of those things working against you and you're not looking at an organization that's inter intersectional enough to say, oh, here's a way we can overcome this barrier and that barrier, then there's just, there's too many roadblocks for you to even apply. Um, so that is, I think, even more important than, you know, the final selection that you make is like removing those barriers to entry. I don't remember what my sister Allie said on her episode. She's, she's a, a, a vice principal of a middle school in Salt Lake City. And yeah, she, she explained this problem so articulately. I don't remember how she said it exactly, but uh, talking about how you, you do like, you do need people of the same, like, um, r like race of an example to do show you these things you can do for students who are that young like they need to see people like them yeah. doing the things that because like w when you're when your mind is in sixth grade that's just it's that simple you do need to see that and i said that so much worse than she did but um yeah well, just the idea that representation matters right that it absolutely yeah. matters yeah yeah and i just wait were any of you I don't know if you were there on, not to keep talking about Pesek, but on Wednesday night and saw Robin Shulkowski play. I wasn't there. I weren't there yet, maybe either of you. But I don't know. I almost, I, I had a chance to work with her beforehand. We had her out uh, to University of Washington, partially to help fund, you know, her trip to the U.S. from Berlin. You know, and here's a woman who's almost 70 years old who plays with beautiful technique. And it's just, I'm crying. I met her and I'm just just crying because other than, you know, seeing Evelyn Glennie very far away a couple of times throughout my life, I just, I have so few examples of a, a woman playing experimental music, um, you know, of her generation on stage. Right. And it's yeah. just like, I didn't, I didn't even, I was, I, you know, I have to say, I totally agree with what you're saying, what your sister was saying, Casey, because it, it blindsided me how important that was and was so inspiring to make me realize, oh, right now my university percussion, you know, students, I, I'm not yet half men and half women. There are more, there are more men than there are women. And we're certainly not at a, um, at a balance of, you know, students of color and white students. And so it's, it's inspiring to work toward that, to, to get representation within their group and bring in guests who can model for everybody. Right. Yeah. So speaking of being inspired by, there are two people on this call who, since you said you didn't mind talking about this, Bonnie, who are female percussionists with awesome. full-time jobs that are moms. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering if Bonnie, if you and Laurel wouldn't mind, as also since your kids are different ages, you could talk a little bit about that because that's really inspiring to me and I would like to have a family someday. And it seems, sometimes it seems 
I mean, I think about it a lot and then like, I don't know how, how I could do that. And I'm seeing you two do this and I'm just curious to hear you talk about it. Cool. I can go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. First off, thanks for saying that, Megan. Um, I think that um, the first thing is that having Robin has actually been really good for me to to have a better understanding of what is actually important and what is not. And that some things about professional commitments are important and some of them just are not. And you just do them to the best of your ability really quickly then. And then otherwise you can't take it home. And um, what it has taught me is to not bring work home nearly as much as I used to. Like Casey and I would come home and we would just like talk about the students and talk about JMU and all this stuff. And we don't do that now. We try really hard not to do that. And that has been a very healthy thing to do. Um, I also, I don't know about Bonnie, but my practice time is down to about 25% of what it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you get like super efficient. Yeah. <laughs> and this whole, yeah, like hold back to that, like what's important and what's not. And like, what can you um, practice away from an instrument. Uh, and the last thing that I'll add is, um, I know in my situation, uh, Casey and I try to share as much as we can. So like, it's not like when we're home with Robin, I'm doing everything for Robin. It's like, no, one of us will get up or sometimes both of us get up and then we're both standing in the kitchen. It's like, Oh, you're going to do it. Oh, okay. Yeah. You make his bottle. Okay. I'll get him, you know, cause yeah. we'll both just spring into action. And I think that makes a big difference. And um, yeah, it helps to know that you don't have to keep all the plates spinning by yourself. You're just keeping like your professional plate spinning by yourself, mm -hmm. but the family plate, you have a, a teammate. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's what I have to say. Your turn, Bonnie. Yeah, I'm 100% behind everything that you had to say. Yeah, and and want to just echo what you said in that last part about what it means to have, you know, um, a partner who is willing to do the the work of parenting along with you. You know, I I don't know anyone who's doing this as a single parent. You know, and that's now suddenly my my thoughts about like being on part of the PAS Diversity Alliance is like, wow, there should be a subgroup for single parents because I have to say it was so inspiring to see uh, Casey and Laurel walking around with your little babe at PASIC. I was like, That's amazing. That is so cool. <laughs> it never even occurred to me to try to bring a kid to PASIC because I just thought I couldn't couldn't handle it. But how beautiful, how wonderful to see both okay. of you making this public commitment to not disappearing, you know, when you when you have kids. I think that's really inspiring yeah. and important. Um, but yeah, you're you're 100 percent right that when you are paying someone to watch your child while you practice, you know, especially, you know, a, a little one, you know, when my, my it's a little older now that my son is three. But, you know, when he was really little and I suffered being away from him, it's like, oh, man. I'm on an overnight gig or I'm paying for someone while to watch him while I practice everything that I've done as an artist has become more meaningful, you know, and I say, I don't say yes to as much things as I, as I used to. And I feel really good yeah. about that. Um, and I would never say that anyone should ever have a child because it will better them as human beings. That's like a ridiculous narrative. <laughs> um, but, you know, surely there's never a right time to, to do it. You know, it's never a wrong time to do it. And, yeah. you know, I, there's so many, there, there actually now are so many women who are doing it that it's, it's awesome. Yeah. There are a lot more role models now than there used to be. I remember, I mean, even in the past five years I and mean, when I, when I, I, this is my fifth year in Missouri and I remember having this conversation with my boss, Julia Gaines, yeah, of course, friend, of you know, and she said, yeah, I can count on one hand, the number of women I know who have families who have full-time university progression. Like positions. They're or so. So, yeah, there's two exactly. hands now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's cool. Yeah. yeah you know, fine. and I have to say one thing that I try to do as well is like, if I'm called in sometimes on Saturday for a rehearsal with my students, I bring my son or my stepsons. Um, 
because I, I feel like actually instead of spending time being scared that you know he or my family is going to be something that counts against me the thing I'm scared of is the next generation of parents feeling afraid um, that having having kids is going to jeopardize who they are as percussionists yeah that's a good point well it seems like since grad school you know and Laurel just mentioned learning to say no which yeah I mean having Robin has I'm I'm the dad, but it's changed me a lot too. Um, you know, I've said no to oh, six, seven things this summer. <laughs> it's like, and I'm not doing any, I'm literally doing none. And not that I would have said yes to that many anyway, even if I was just single, I wouldn't do that many, but yeah, it's just very easy now. It's just like, no, no, thanks. Don't want to, uh, don't want to, and feel like I need to be home. But, um, I have a topic today. I have a sound for you guys. I don't think I've done a a sound in a while. It's Mission Moon for Studs Lego. He's off to pioneer the empty spaces of the moon with Lego, his wonderful building bricks. Bill Bridge. Lego builds it. Bill Moon Tractor. Lego builds it. Bill Missile Defense Center. Lego builds it. Lego, the wonderful building toy, builds a whole wide world for you. So this is a Lego commercial from 1966, and it's one of many TV and radio ads that included sound contributions from a composer and sound designer named Daphne Oram. Has anyone ever heard of Daphne Oram? I have, because my spouse is, like, obsessed with her and all of the radiophonic stuff. Yeah, that's so not even a musician, but but they just love all of this old stuff. So it happens in our house often before bed or to just creep people out. (laughs) That's really cool. cool Yeah, that's really fun to hear because she's like my new discovery. And I'm yeah so thrilled with this CD that the track is on. And the CD is called Oramics. And it's a collection of a lot of the TV and radio work that the BBC Radiophonic Workshop did which i'll tell you a little bit about in a second but also her compositions which are these really really cool tape compositions so yeah the cd is oramix and daphne orm just the quick nuts and bolts on her she's from wiltshire england and lived from 1925 to 2003 she's often referred to as one of the unsung heroes of electronic music and synthesizer development She's famous for founding the BBC Radiophonic Workshop and creating a light synthesizing electronic instrument called the Oramics Machine. So in 1943, she begins working at the BBC as a sound engineer, and by 1957, she opens in one of the studio rooms there. I think it's room 13, uh, kind of ironically, because it's mysterious, something called the Radiophonic Workshop. And they do all this work for TV, for radio, and they did the very famous, you guys have probably heard this before. Yes, because yes, it's the original Doctor Who. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's the original Doctor Who theme, which was not composed by Daphne Oram, but one of her colleagues who was hired later, Delia Derbyshire, who ended up leaving the radiophonic workshop as synthesizers were developing. And she didn't like that synthesizers were taking over because she thought music should still be, or electronic music should still be created by hand because she's cut and pasting and manipulating tape speeds and all that fun stuff that they're doing at that time. So Daphne Oram leaves the BBC in 1960 and devotes herself to something called the Aramics Machine. And from what I heard, she left the BBC because they didn't want her working in that studio more than six or seven hours a day because they were worried about the effects of the sounds on, like, anyone's brain. So she has this 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 quote saying, like, well, if you're not going to let me work in this this great thing that I've dreamed of creating and that I've now created, I'm I'm leaving it. So she does exactly that. And she focuses on this thing called her Oramics machine, which is literally a light synthesizing 
music creator, you can paint on these glass slides or on these film strips and they feed through this machine and the machine has these uh, photo cells, which is like the same thing while your nightlight works, right? It detects when there's no light and then it triggers the light bulb to come on. So she has all those hooked up to the oscillators and the tone generators and you can literally paint on these what look like film strips and it will interpret it as pitch and oscillator and all the all the effects and it's this really really elaborate machine i'll definitely be overlaying some some pictures of it in fact i've just got one for you all right right here this is what it looks like it's almost like news you know i, I often think that a lot of the earliest music and the most experimental music is is linked in this cool way and that picture just looks so much like news yeah yeah that's true that's a good point it's so cool. Yeah, I just think it's really, really, really cool. And it's just, um, yeah, so, so so anyway, that is Daphne Orm. And she has this quote that she supposedly had pinned to the Radiophonic Workshop room and then took with her uh, to her to her own studio when she uh, went off and do, did all her own things. And it goes like this. We have also sound houses where we practice and demonstrate all sounds and their generation. We have harmonics, which you have not, of quarter so sounds and lesser slides of sounds, diverse instruments of music likewise to you unknown, some sweeter than any you have, together with bells and rings that are dainty and sweet. We represent small sounds as great and deep. Likewise, diverse trembling and warblings of sound, which in their original are entire. We represent and imitate all articulate sounds and letters and the voices of beasts and birds. We have certain helps which set to the ear to do further and hearing greatly. Yeah, uh, further the hearing greatly. Sorry, this is a, an old quote, so it's kind of weird to read. It's very, it's a lot older than you think. Uh, we also have diverse, strange, and artificial echoes reflecting the voice many times as if it were tossing it and some that give back the voice louder than it came, some shriller and some deeper, yay, that's how old it is, yay, some rendering the voice differing in the letters or articulate sound from that they receive. We also have means to convey sounds in tubes and pipes in strange lines and dissonances. 1624, the philosopher and author Francis Bacon. Okay. So it's just interesting that way back then, 1624, he's talking about the same stuff that is like totally the spirit of what she's doing. Sorry, I read that so poorly. It's actually like really hard to read. So anyway, that's Daphne Oram and the Oramics machine and the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. Megan, you have a topic today, right? I do. Um, can I ask a question first? Yeah. Um, I'm curious about, Bonnie had sent a couple of, of her upcoming projects and one, I, a, a few episodes ago, I guess 164 with Matthew Henry, Henry, my topic was about prison music programs. And it was about a, a New Music USA project I saw called Inspiring Creativity in Kansas Prisons. And it was a collaboration between uh, Sarah Fursoff, a flutist, in collaboration with New Morse Code, which is Hannah oh, Collins and yeah. Mike Compatello. And so I reported on this and I was so, and we, we were also kind of brainstorming, like what other projects have you heard about that are happening in prisons? And sure enough, one of the things that you're doing right now um, is a project with, with Eliza Brown, composer Eliza Brown, and working with incarcerated women in Indiana. Can you talk a little, about, a little bit about this project? Yeah, and I wanna say that my um, involvement in this project is really new. Um, Eliza Brown is a, is a composer who was, was in Chicago and now she's um, in Greencastle, Indiana. And maybe two years ago now did a project with the group Ensemble Del Niente, mm -hmm. a group uh, in Chicago who I occasionally play with, based on some stories from incarcerated women at the Indiana Women's Prison. And so there was a, a little one act opera that you know she had she used as co-authors on this project these particular women um and she's had a really fruitful at times challenging but really wonderful project with these women and we've been talking for years about doing 
you know, maybe not quite evening length, but somewhere from, you know, 30 to 40, 45 minute um, speaking percussionist project. And we decided that what we want to do is see if we can continue the work she's been doing in the Indiana women's prison. And where we are right now in the project is meetings uh, with Eliza and some of these women are going to start in February or March. I'm going to go out there probably not until next fall. That's when I'll start working with them. But kind of the, the premise for the project is that these women are doing research on the institution in which they live, just the history of that institution. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to use as the basis of the text for the project. And the musical materials are going to be just things that could be found inside the prison or are allowed inside the prison. And while these um, sound like kind of odd choices, there are a couple of reasons why we're working in this way. Though initially my thought was like, oh, can we, can we tell these women's stories? You know, can we find a way to get their voices out into the world? In truth, that's not actually the most safe or comfortable thing for them. Right. Uh, and both Eliza and I feel very strongly that this kind of work, uh, education and artistic work within the prison system should be a form of epistemic justice, meaning that, that it's almost like a way of like, can there be some reparations for the way these, these people are treated, how they're living their lives. Um, so one thing to do is to work on how they can do their own research, get their voices out there in a way that is safe for them. Um, but in a way that's also very revolutionary, this idea that they're researching the place in which they live. Um, so that's part of it. And I do want to be able to eventually share this project with them in a way that's beyond just doing video. So the thought is that we'll only use materials that we can find there or, you know, that are, that are safe to bring in, which at a, a maximum security prison, like the one at the IWP, you know, that's, that's a real challenge. I've certainly done a few performances in, in prisons before where it's like, well, okay, we'll let you take in your timpani mallet, but no triangle, no triangle leader. Yeah. That's wow. kind of, yeah. So it's, it's kind of a, it's still, the project's still in its infancy. We're really excited about it, but, um, you know, you could check out Tangente's project, Piece Her Together, is part of the larger thing that Eliza did with him. And um, stay tuned for what's going to happen with our co-authors in the Indiana Women's Prison sometime in 2019. Cool. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then another one of your projects is in Turkmenistan? Right. How, what is uh, what was your initial connection with that? And you're going in like two weeks. Yeah, I'm going back in two That's weeks. For my yeah. second, second time going, and I, you know, someone asked me the other day, and I can't quite remember how I got connected with them. It might have been they just found me online, but it's a project through the U.S. Embassy. It's basically partially a, a you know government project that helps to fo foster cultural exchange through music through another organization called American Voices that goes to these places in the world that are kind of culturally sensitive or in the process of opening up, you know, Turkmenistan is one of these places that's that you know, is former Soviet um, and is in the process of still opening up to the rest of the world. There are like less than a thousand visas issued each year. It's a really hard place to get in and out of. But one of the things that's really interesting is that there are all of these string players who had teachers who were conservatory trained in St. Petersburg, for example. So there's like fantastic string playing and piano playing. The brass and percussion playing is, is an area that they're still developing. Um, so I'm going over there to work with their percussion section and the National Orchestra of Turkmenistan. Mm -hmm. And last time I was there, I helped to facilitate donations of musical instruments to the orchestra through the, through the embassy. So I helped them to find and transport a xylophone. And thus play a xylophone concerto, which, as, as you know, there aren't very many xylophone concerti. So I played um, Alan Havanis's concerto, Fantasy on Japanese Woodprints. But this time what I'm doing actually is I commission a new piece of music based on some folk music that the director of that orchestra just handed to me. He handed me all these, you know, he couldn't even give me files, but he handed me you know, in plastic sheets, all of these, this music that was like, here, here is kind of an orchestral arrangement of some folk music that's important in Turkmenistan. I don't know, maybe you can do something with it. So I hired a former student to write a concerto 
for xylophone, vibraphone, and some weird found objects that I'll bring. And that's the next step in this cultural exchange is we'll see wow. how it works to do some Turkmen music with this American twist and, and do some, some teaching for their, you know, they have a music boarding school there and kind of a conservatory. So super excited about it. It's, um, that's really cool. It's a totally crazy project in Central Asia, a place that not many Americans get a chance to see. You know, and, and it feels like it's the kind of important when you, there's so many difficult things to listen to and hear about on the news, and it feels good to do some cultural exchange that feels like it can be uniformly positive. Yeah. So you, you see this collaboration continuing into the future? Yeah, I mean, I hope so. This is our, my yeah. second time going with a conductor friend of mine, and, you know, hopefully the relationship will continue to grow. I met so many just incredibly kind people, great musicians there. Yeah. yeah. What's the food like there? It's it's good. You know, I'm mostly vegetarian, so I guess I don't partake in some of the most interesting things. Apparently the meat that's local is very fresh and good. But there's a lot of, um, you know, hummus, baba ganoush. I had fermented camel's milk. That was really fun. Oh. It was good. It was kind of like an egg cream with a kick. Oh. Uh, yeah, lentils, that kind of, that uh -huh. kind of food, but it's, you know, delicious, absolutely delicious, and incredible markets with crazy spices and wonderful things. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah, that program, I don't know, I can't remember if actually if I've done a topic on that before, but I'm familiar with that um, organization, American Voices, okay. and actually, I think that there is some ba their their base might be in St. Louis, so yes, close to me. True. They are in St. Yes, of course. So John Ferguson is their founder, yes. and it's Spencer, what's his last name, who kind of holds on the fort in St. Louis while John John lives in Thailand. But yeah, absolutely. Right. Thailand, yeah. And they have they have this a lot of what they do, they what they want to do is get American music out into the world. And some of the some component is is like they're interested in Broadway or hip hop or you know these other very specific arms of that. So what is it? Yeah, project in Kurdistan or something that's all about, you know, specifically I don't know, I'm just talking now because I can't remember. But it's, it's an incredible Lebanon project. Also. In Lebanon, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All over the world. John's gone all over the world. It's it's a really cool project. So right now this this at at this time, they're doing tons of Bernstein stuff in relation to the centennial. So we're, I'm going to help the orchestra prepare like the symphonic suite from West Side Story and make cool. that work as, well, as part of the centennial celebration. And some Christmas music. I'll be there till Christmas Eve doing Christmas music <laughs> in Afghanistan. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's good times. Awesome. Megan, I think you have a topic, right? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, so... Let's see. My topic this week is from Greg Sendall's blog on, um, sorry, I'm forgetting. Oh, the, on Arts Journal, which I check pretty regularly. And this was an article actually that our chair sent to us. Um, and it's about Lawrence Conservatory. So my topic feels a little bit like an ad for Lawrence Conservatory. And I don't mean it to be that way, but I think it's a, it could, spark some good conversation uh, since we all are here right now, our, our university professors. So uh, the, it's, the article is called A Culture That Supports Creativity. And the dean at Lawrence, his name is Brian Pertle. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Conservatory is at Lawrence University in Wisconsin. And I've heard buzz about what's happening there and they're very progressive conservatory. And this article sort of gave some concrete examples of why. And Greg actually quoted some things from an email directly from Brian, and I thought I would just start with that, um, Brian's words. An important thing to know about the Lawrence Conservatory of Music that it is an un all undergraduate, inst oh, sorry, whoops, is that right? Yes, is that it is an all undergraduate institution sitting within a nationally ranked liberal arts college. At Lawrence, attaining your highest musical potential requires expanding from your intellectual capacity as well. It isn't a coincidence that nearly half of the students in every incoming conservatory class are pursuing a double degree program, a, a double degree program, a bachelor of music and a BA in another field. This intellectual curiosity and eagerness to break down departmental boundaries so a student can learn to dance between disciplines has a profound influence on conservatory focused initiatives. 
The Lawrence Conservatory is creating a culture that merges world-class technical training and opportunities to deeper explore other vital areas of musicianship like creativity, play, improvisation, exploration of various music traditions, rethinking standard performance practices, and elevating the power of music as a transformational tool for social engagement. Lawrence is constantly deepening and expanding this vision. They also have this 21st century musicianship initiative that has a lot more information in it. Um, so some of those initiatives, I'm not going to, I would encourage everyone to read the article. It's on Arts Journal website and on Greg Sandow's blog through Arts Journal. And some of those initiatives are new required musicology sequence, micro operas, presto conservatory tours, music for all, new degree program called Bachelor of Musical Arts and Jazz and Contemporary Improvisation, the Refuge Foundation, uh, or this is one thing, the Refuge Foundation, Corey Chisel and Lawrence collaboration, and another called Deep Listening. So if any of those sort of spark your interest, I would encourage you to get in. They actually break down all of those and who's sort of the um, point person for each of those projects. So even getting in touch with one of those people, um, it would be a great idea. Um, and also something that's really fun is that there is a conservatory dog and his name is Zeke <laughs> and he naps in Brian, the Dean's office. And he also goes to sit in with student when students audition at the school and with the idea that this will make auditioning students feel more comfortable and less afraid of the an audition situation. Sold. Yeah, exactly. I thought that was so cool. Um, so anyway, that's just a little bit of a introduction to this article. I'd encourage everyone to go read it, um, but lots of initiatives that are happening there. And we, you know, we have these conversations at faculty meetings all the time. And I think one of the biggest challenges is that a lot of people agree that new initiatives are a great idea, but the problem is that music students are already completely overwhelmed with large course loads. And in order to start some of these new initiatives and to make space for them, we maybe need to get rid of some of the things that are already happening and in the curriculum or just programs that have existed for a long time, but reevaluating if these are necessary and effective anymore. And I think that's the hardest conversation to have, especially with professors who feel very attached to these programs and have run them for decades. So I'm curious if you're having these same conversations in your faculty meetings and if there are any initiatives at your schools or initiatives that you're trying to start um, to help I've, sure we're preparing our students for work in the contemporary workforce. We talked a little about this. Well, we talked a lot about this, I guess, at the panel discussion, the university education panel discussion. And something I found myself feeling, because I do see it at my own university, but also many others, there's all it's it's very popular right now. And to use music to teach this other thing. And we all agree the other thing is valuable. Like literally say like, okay, every, like, okay, there's three of us in this call right now. Laurel had to step away, but it's like, okay, by show of hands, who thinks things like, well, we've already talked about it. Like diversity is important. Like all our hands go up. Mm -hmm. And I think if you did that in any panel discussion at PASIC or any concert at PASIC, I think we would agree that huge and vast majority overwhelming hands would go up. So it, it makes me, it makes me wonder like, is I think music is already teaching a lot of these good things. Like, I think like, because there is such a consensus of like, Hey, we need to think this way and we need to have diverse composers and we need to make sure that composition contests have a wide pool like all the stuff we've been saying i think all our colleagues generally agree and they didn't go to a special program with a changed curriculum or a, you know like they studied sure they studied dead white guys which were tired of studying but along with that like when you study robert schumann you also learn how messed up he was and you also learn like like there's so many big lessons in a lot of the so so like i don't know i like i 
I'm 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 just not uh, qualified to explain why or how this is happening. But I just know that like there's this huge like-mindedness of this stuff is important. And we all think that. And those people at Lawrence Conservatory, by the way, that's where Laurel and I met, fun fact. But uh, oh, hey, I forgot about that. Right, yeah, because Nancy so, Zeltzman has her festival. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Of yeah, course. that's one of the locations. So anyway, I've I've fond thoughts of Lawrence, but like the people who are inventing that curriculum, and I know the people in my university are saying, like, we have to take steps to do these new things and we need to get rid of some of the old curriculum to put this new stuff in that's important it's like they went through the initial curriculum and now their minds are changed for the better like now they hold these these values so i don't know i i'm i'm conflicted about like that change is like definitely better you know hmm. Did, like, did that make sense? I don't know if that made sense. I feel like it made sense when the panel discussion. I don't know if it made sense now, but I mean, it's a hard, it's a hard conversation to have because yeah, you have to tell people what you're teaching isn't important, right? To make room for this other stuff. But I think even before that, you have to build a case and say it's not important and that it's not working. And what I'm saying right now is that I think there's evidence to the contrary. Like I think that just studying art even just as it is like i feel like you couldn't <laughs> like if you're studying art right any art it can't mess that up like you're gonna hold these values of inclusion and diversity and and music is forever like you're gonna find those values maybe but like large swaths of humanity are erased from that story right i mean i mean some of these very I mean, some of this goes as far as like, okay, like, have you, have you followed at all of this, like music theory examples by women yeah. uh, project that's happening right now? I think that's super awesome. And I wonder what my life would have been like. No, no, I, no, like, oh, no, I, I haven't. Schumann for these things, but it's awesome. You should check it out. I, I, I haven't, but I guess what I'm saying is that like the fact that we all agree that that's a problem, like, yeah, like a whole, like, yeah, Daphne Oram, unsung hero of electronic yeah. music. Teach her alongside Burris. Right. right. Yeah, we absolutely should. But but yet, like, we have all these people like finishing in our field that agree like, hey, what's why aren't we teaching her alongside Varez? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, so. Like, it is producing those good that good mindset. Yeah, but we don't have we don't we don't know what what the mindset would be if we actually taught that. Right? That's a, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, maybe it would be totally even stronger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, I don't know. I don't know. You can edit this out if you want. I don't know how real this podcast gets, but like going back to this, <laughs> this talk about how we find ways to get over barriers of entry to our universities. I have to say very explicitly that it was incredibly difficult for me sometimes. I was going through a very similar curricular shift one of the first um, universities to um, to do this was DePaul University, their 21st century musician initiative with Greg Sandow was one of the advisory board. I sat on an advisory board with Greg Sandow. Um, and it's great, but sometimes it just felt like lip service to parents so that they feel okay paying, well, at Lawrence, I just Googled it, it would be four forty seven thousand and a half dollars a year to send your kid to school. At DePaul, it is more than that. Um, you know, we want to make it more inclusive and have all of these opportunities for students in this very expensive liberal arts education. Look, I'm a product of that. I went to Oberlin. That place is more expensive than any of these places. Sometimes these initiatives just feel like fancy ways to sell parents on going to school. And I wonder if a curricular program like, for example, you know, adding something like a different major that allows students who are non-conservatory or non-music, you know, music majors to have some interaction with the conservatory or music school music majors are a way to go. I can talk about, you know, my program has the American Music Studies program, which is a program that absolutely spends a lot more time focusing on American popular music and that kind of musicology, history, theory. But those students do have a performance obligation that they have to fill. They figure out what that is. I had two of them on Friday night open my percussion ensemble concert 
they learned how to play some of the James Tenney percussion quartets. And nice. by God, they did it. I didn't nice. think they were going to do it. But when they could barely read music at the beginning of the quarter, getting to like standing on stage, you know, what that meant. I don't know for my grad percussion students to stand on stage with people who, you know, were just learning this. I, th I think it was good and important, but like, and I'm talking a lot, but it seems that it has to do two things. It has to not just be lip service to diversity and to parents who are paying a lot of money to send their kids to school. And it has to be something where your whole community actually does change and adjust for it, for it to be worthwhile. Right. Yeah. I mean, we should send this to, to Greg. He'll, he, he'll comment. He, he will. Yeah. <laughs> do, you think he would be on, do you think he would come on the podcast if we asked yeah. him? Absolutely. Yeah. I do. Oh. Yeah. I do. Yeah, I think you should ask him. That would be interesting. Cool. I think that's great what you said. And and I guess, yeah, the changes I'm talking about that I see are like these like major, major changes. Like people are talking about dropping this whole uh, like like whole giant piece of music ed curriculum to substitute it with like a whole block on language. And like I, I and not not to say that that's not important and valuable, but I just some of the descriptions I've read, it's like, yeah, that's great. And I'm so sorry if someone's parents didn't teach them that when they were eight. But I don't know what that if that's what college is for, <laughs> you know, like it's just it's not higher ed. I mean, I would need to read this description to you because I think you guys would totally agree. Um, so, I, yeah, I probably shouldn't speak of it in such vague terms because I make myself sound meaner than I am. Um, but, but I mean, also like, you know, music ed, for example, like so much technology is available that wasn't available 10 years ago, definitely 20 years ago. And so like the curriculum has to advance to include these things that are but now if, part of the classroom that can but, enhance the classroom experience. But that, one, that one's a really good example because you hear that one all the time. We need to drop this one block and replace it with a block on how to build a website. Dude, those are designed so anyone can build them. You don't like if you're if you're paying for a college class on how to build a Weebly or a, a Squarespace web, like you're getting ripped off. <laughs> like anyone can do that. You know what I mean? Like they say that stuff all the time. And I think they're just like replacing it with stuff that you can totally go learn on your own. Right. And you can say that, I think, partially. Yes, I totally 100% agree that you can learn how to build a website by yourself. But what you have done, Casey, in your career singularly is like made a case for yourself and a point of difference for the kind of work that you're doing. And um, that's something you were good at. You naturally did, I think, in terms of like current composer performers working in our field, you know, you're probably the most successful person in this country doing that right now. Um, and what I think a lot of young undergraduates really need is a mentor who, who helps them to find that whatever, their hole in the universe that they're going to fill. Because in addition to being fabulously great technical players, they need to find that point of difference. So that's part of, I think, what building a website is about. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good point. As someone who's like taught a lot of entrepreneurship classes with varying degrees of success <laughs> mostly on the lower end of that spectrum <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah, thank, the process thanks. of building a website helps you identify you know ask questions about yourself as an artist right i mean that's like i guess it does i'm just i mean thanks so much bonnie that's like so super kind of you to say and yeah way overblown but thank you it's it's um it's, true. it's uh but like if your teacher is like sitting there like you're in college class that you're paying 40 grand a year to go to and they're teaching you how to do stuff that there are just like gobs and oodles of youtube tutorials they're like come on that's like dishonest i, I understand what you're saying for sure and i don't know what the answer is you know i think well, it's it, i think it really goes back to what we were talking about before but oh are we paying lip service to this yeah it's lip service dramatic, yeah. are we paying lip service to these kind of direly needed systematic changes by trying to, and I'm sure a lot of what's happening at Lawrence is wonderful. I would love to like have an actual class on Pauline Oliveros's sonic, you know, meditations and deep listening. That's right. a thing. If you could really sit and do that 
for an extended period of time over the course of a semester, great. But all that to say, it means nothing if we don't address some of the systemic issues with higher education in this country, how unaffordable it is, how inaccessible it is to people to even get into a place like Lawrence, right? You need right. so many countless hours of private lessons and, um, you know, the privilege of paying for them to get into this place. It's just, you know, there's got to be another way. And I think maybe we're at the verge of some breaking point that if, if a whole bunch of institutions get together and smart people sit around and talk about it and students and parents get angry enough about it, like maybe we're on the verge of something big. It doesn't seem like there's going to be a one size fits all answer, but yeah. Um, like something, something, something's got to give because there are a whole bunch of unemployed people with a lot of undergraduate student debt from small yeah. liberal arts colleges where they got an excellent education. Yeah, and I mean, that's another huge, di very different problem in, in my mind is just the cost and, yeah, the the debt bubble from college. And, yeah, I mean, yeah, all that is, is like a huge thing. But like Megan said just now, like when you, I would, sorry, Bonnie said, I would like to have this meditation class. Megan said, like, yeah, I would too. It's like, man, I would too. But speaking toward the whole recruiting thing, I also see like, well, we need to just give students what they want so they'll come here. So we're going to change our curriculum or make a new degree so they can like hodgepodge what classes they want. And the truth is we always, you know, you often get that student that comes to school and says, yeah, I'm just not that into music theory. I didn't know I'd have to do that. Is that really that important? You're like, yes, that is important. And they're like, hmm, if only I could invent a degree where I can play in the band and the orchestra, but not do music theory. Hmm, like we can't give them that, you know, like it would be so irresponsible to give them that. So I, I'm worried about like us making all these changes like to help with the rising tuition costs. And the solution in their mind is, well, we've got to get more students. So we got to convince more students to come here. So, hey, let's give them classes that they want to take, but they're not the classes they might need. Because we know what good musicianship like, is. I guess there could be there could be a model in which there was a student who wanted to play in ensembles, um, have a life in music, and was much more interested in, say, doing research in musicology, that kind of a thing, you know, where they didn't they didn't think they were gonna be professional performers. You know, I, I feel like in a way, if you find ways to build that rigor in, in some ways that might be smarter because how many Oh my goodness, now we're getting really real. How many of these people <laughs> who are, you know, unemployed graduates um, really could or should have taken on a performance degree? You know, if we really right. think about how many of our students really, no matter how much we try to impart whatever the heck it is we think is important, how many of them really have the skill set even intrinsically to become professional performers? Not very See, many. But See, see, but again, I worry, I worry that if you, whenever you cater to the money, whether it's trying to bring the student in or trying to get the student the job, you're like bending the craft. Sure. And I just think we have to do that really slowly. You know, I, there's a, a, a quote I like called, um, perfection is the enemy of good. And if you try to just like fix everything and make it perfect, you're not even going to get anything good done. So, I mean, like people's minds and systems are not changed suddenly. They're changed very, very slowly. So I don't know, I just have this fear that like in trying to cater to all these financial things like recruiting and getting people jobs, we're like, we might lose the core of what it is. Cause I, I don't know if it, uh, of course I want my students to have jobs. I mean, it's, it's on my tenure track schedule to like get students jobs. You know, your students need to have successes. Of course I want them to get jobs, but I don't know where it says like the job of education is to get people employed. No, no, no. Of course. Like tell that to a philosophy department, you know, they will be like, ah, we can't really teach philosophy. Well, if our primary goal is to get people jobs, you know what I mean? And there's just so much talk in, in the, there's so much in the air with that and it, it just it just worries me a little bit but i guess what i'm what i'm saying is that like success in the end of someone who has devoted a significant amount of time studying music in college i think we're saying the same thing it doesn't have to be about getting a performance job right 
there, there are all sorts of ways to have success and allow for students to study music while they're in college. So sometimes that's as simple as just like taking a gen ed class, whatever, a, a survey class of some kind. Mm -hmm. Sometimes maybe it's having non-majors play, maybe it's having minors, but like, I wonder if a, one part of this solution is to actually have many different tracks that mm -hmm. students can choose, you know. Yeah. That they're not, you know, if, if they know and you know, and everybody knows that they're not gonna be doing performance as a primary way of making their living after they're done, that they're not getting getting in trouble with me for not practicing for three hours a day, or right. you know they don't take the the last in the the, the theory sequence. Do you know what I mean? It's like I, I think maybe a good music school is more about who and how you let in and how it can be inclusive than about who and what you push out. Um, yeah. Which is to say that you should be any less rigorous for those folks for whom you really feel like this is this is a way it's so good for you to learn your craft to this to this point but I don't know sometimes some days it feels like a pyramid scheme yeah yeah, yeah and I think having more I mean less of I definitely don't agree Casey I mean I, I agree with you and that I don't agree that we need to just create classes to be a good product so that people will come buy the product I <laughs> definitely yeah. am against that but I think if there are more alternate routes for people, because I mean, a huge problem in our country right now is a, the lack of appreciation for any type of art. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I feel like I'm faced with that constantly of like, am I making this person hate music because they're not succeeding in my program? Right. Is there what, okay, let me think, rather than just failing out, is there a way I can redirect this student so that music is still a part of his or her life and even in college in this program, but that they're not on track to be a, a professional performer or a professional music educator? Um, and, you know, also, I mean, may, maybe is there a path where they can be, you know, something with visual studies and or design or uh, composition or I mean all these things that would can involve music and they could have a successful career in them and and I think that you know also part of the reason why all of this is shifting is because there are alternate path careers for musicians now that aren't just playing an orchestra teaching in a university or teaching in a public school you know there are so many examples of people who are doing combinations of many things or com many combining many disciplines also so, sure. so i feel i do also feel and bonnie you mentioned something about just you know somebody just needing a mentor or the importance of the importance of an artist having a, a, a an art student having a mentor it's like i do feel like by having the privilege to have the position that we do if there's anyone who is very serious about this i'm sure all three of us are a hundred percent there for them and that will always exist as long as there's a full-time percussion teacher, you know? Right. Yeah, and it's like how many, my, I remember being struck with this by my undergrad teacher. He said, oh, this is one of the last apprentices, apprenticeships. I was like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, you used to be apprenticed to become a blacksmith or to do this or to do that. Where else in college do you get the kind of attention that you get in an hour? Or even I have some half hour students. Or oh even yeah, a, that's Mike, Ro really. Mike Rosen said that, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's yeah I thing. think he said it here too. Yeah. yeah. He says it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's Mike Rosen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But that's that's like that's super expensive. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and even in you, there's maybe something kind of comparable in like a studio art class where you have your teacher um, wandering the room and looking at your work, and you have you know four, four hours in an open studio. But there's almost nothing else like that. You know. Well, you know, yeah, God, we could go on and on and on. But um, yeah, thanks for going. Thanks for going so deep on this, y'all. It's really it's, that's great. It really, it really we have to talk about this. It's important, you know. Yeah, uh, and I y'all yeah, going deep. I guess that's what I feel like. I feel like the more we do this, the less deep we get to go. And it's like mm -hmm. it's higher ed. You should be going like huh. as deep as possible into this craft. And if if people want to like do some of this, some of that, some of that, and they think they know what they need for their career, then they can just take the classes they want to and. Maybe they don't declare a degree and they get something general from the university that says they've completed four years worth of this many credits. I know a lot of schools have, 
uh, something general like that. I don't know. Anyway, but we let's do Ben's question really quick. Well, as quick as you want to, Bonnie. It doesn't have to be really quick. But Ben says, hi, Bonnie. I'm sorry I couldn't join today. I have admired your performances at PASIC, as have we all, when studying the standards with Stephen Schick, such as Anaka Stockhausen and the like. Did you feel you were working to create your own interpretations or imitating the master? I know there is an Eastern philosophy of imitating the guru's style, but so many of Steve's students seem to have a unique blend of his choices with their own personalities. How do you feel he helped you develop as a player? And more generally, what was it like studying with the legend? Steve Schick is a legend, and he's totally awesome. Um, and up till that point, I feel like I had played no Stockhausen. Um, you know, a lot of the pieces I chose to study with Steve, I actually specifically chose because they were his rep, right? And those of us on this call who are professors know that actually it's a heck of a lot easier to teach when someone is playing your rep. It's like, oh, this is easy. I know. I kind of know what to say. I know five different ways in to talk about this. Obviously, it's something I love and I'm excited about. So I wanted to get as much as possible as I could out of Steve. So I absolutely did learn a whole bunch of pieces that were new to me, you know, in terms of those like those particular dead European dudes. Um, and it was awesome. And I, I feel like in those moments, he engaged a lot with me and it felt like a really worthwhile choice. Um, so that was great. And, and it, like as an encouragement to people who are studying with teachers they love, you can learn a lot by playing some of your teacher's rep. Um, that said, I brought him all kinds of stuff that maybe he didn't want to hear. And he was super gracious about it and always found something uh, to tell me. And I would say that I learned the most from Steve during the years. For two of my three years at UCSD, I was his TA for the La Jolla Symphony. And the La Jolla Symphony is a large community orchestra. Um, nobody's, nobody's paid except for actually the two TAs who are, <laughs> and, and, you know, and the director. Um, so it's a whole bunch of volunteers from La Jolla, California. And you can just Google La Jolla and see what the people are like there. Probably, I don't need to tell you. Um, and let me tell you, Steve had these older women in the string section just eating out of his hand while playing the U.S. premiere of Zanaka's Metastasis. It was awesome. They would do anything that he asked and love it. Uh, and there's nothing like that kind of, it's not just charisma, and it's absolutely connected to what we were talking about earlier in this episode about, you know, how we go deeper with things and, um, you know, find ways to not just scratch the surface, right, but hone into their craft. He got all sorts of people interested in playing this kind of music. And the way that um, he got a whole orchestra to follow him and be inspired was what I learned most from Steve. It's like, you do you in the best way possible, and that's just completely irresistible, hmm. right? So that that was my lesson from Steve. I'd like, say he was infectious on the episode, on, the, on his episode yeah. here. Right, yeah. Megan? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was incredible. I mean, just his way of telling a story is unbelievable. It's just so engaging. Just, like, comfortable, gracious. I felt like he, like, just met me. He doesn't know me enough to like me yet, but I felt like he <laughs> likes me. And it's like, it's just great. It's, and it felt... He probably does like you. He, he might. He probably does. But it really felt just really, really good. Bonnie, I wanted to tell you uh, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of my first, I guess, I think it is my first speaking percussionist piece. Yeah. And you might know it. it's one of Bev's, Beverly Johnston's. Mm -hmm. It is All Too Consuming mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by Diana McIntosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it. It's so good. And it's it's written for a woman, but it totally works as a man. You know, yeah. so the, the tape is playing. It's a female voice. It's her voice. And you're acting that part as if that's your thoughts. But yeah, nobody seemed to mind. And uh, yeah, it's just been like such a hit for me. Cool. I've been awesome. playing it a lot. Awesome. Yeah, people shouldn't feel, you know, much hesitation about playing these pieces. And like, if you no. want, for anyone listening, one piece of advice for taking on a piece like that for the first time is you don't actually have to have any acting training. I'd say think of yourself as a storyteller. You know, right. just 
just think, you're, oh, I'm telling this story, and that's one of the most natural things in the world that humans do is we listen to and tell stories every day. And if you're a good percussionist and if it's a good piece, it's going to come through. Oh, cool, cool. Well, you guys, thanks so much. That was really fun. And, yeah, Megan, thanks for joining. And, Ben, thanks for the question. And, Laurel, thanks. She's away from her computer right now. But, uh, Bonnie Whiting, it's great to finally really get to chat yeah. with you for, like, a solid awesome. hour. Thank you both, all three of you, so much. This has been wonderful. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, everybody, we'll catch you on 170. Thanks a bunch. Okay. Thank you. Bye.